Hi, my name is Mr. Phillips. I'm a retired teacher. I retired last May. I taught middle school English for 30 years. Can you believe it? But that's not my biggest claim to fame. My biggest claim to fame is I am Mrs. Eddie's brother-in-law. Let's see, Mrs. Eddie, the great fourth grade teacher at Mather Heights. I bet you know her. I married her sister. Anyway, like a lot of people, I'm sitting around with not much to do. And luckily for me, Mrs. Eddie said, hey, how would you like to read a great book by the Great Horn Spoon? And uh, maybe my kids could listen to it, my students. And I said, I'd love it. Thank you so much. So, um, I don't know, for a while I'll read a chapter a day, and if you feel like it, you can uh, listen to it. It's a good book. Um, by the Great Horn Spoon, it's by a guy named Sid Fleischman. And I was reading about him. He was born in uh, 1920, and he died in 2010. So he was an old man, had a good long life, 90 years, just died about 10 years ago. He wrote a ton of books. Uh, he wrote The Whipping Boy. Man, that's a good book. Um, won the Newberry for that. This is another super famous book he wrote by the Great Horn Spoon. Here, I'll read the back. We intend to come sailing back to Boston in a year. We will be as rich as can be. If your money has run out, why not mine some gold in California? Seems obvious to 12-year-old Jack and his seafaring companion and butler, praiseworthy. Join them as they stow away on a ship bound for California with the hope of striking it rich so that Jack's Aunt Arabella won't lose her estate, that means her house, and the home where she, was ra where she raised Jack and his sisters since they were small. Will Jack and Praiseworthy find gold or will they find trouble instead? Well, by the looks of that cover, somebody's going to be finding some trouble. That looks like a fight or maybe it's going to be. The one dude is huge, but that other guy looks pretty strong. I don't know, maybe we're going to hear about that. But we know they're going to go to California looking for gold. I bet you guys know something about this. What was it? 1849, they found gold in California, not too far from your school, just right up the road in Coloma. Maybe you'll go there someday. Right here in California, right by where we live, they found gold. Well, tons of people in 1849 said, I'm going to go get me some of that gold. In fact, so many of them went, they were called 49ers. In fact, it's so popular. San Francisco's football team, I bet you knew this, right? What are they called? The 49ers. That's why they're called the 49ers. Because so many people came to California in 1849 to look for gold. Well, how, well let's see, maybe you live in New York City or Boston or someplace like that. How do you get to California in 1849? Can't take a plane, haven't invented them yet. Can't take a, a car. No cars yet. Could you take a train? Yeah, they had invented trains, but no trains made it all the way across the country in 1849. That didn't happen until I think like 1868, you know, 20 years later. So how do you do it? You take a boat, you take a ship. I wish I had a globe, but I've got this. So here's like a map. And here's all these people over in, uh, say New York or Boston. And they'd love to get over here to California if they could, but they can't get across. So if they take a boat, well, see, wouldn't it be great if they could get right through there? Well, that's land. It's Panama. Nowadays, you can. Somebody dug a big ditch called the, do you know it? The Panama Canal. But that didn't happen in 1849. That didn't happen until about 1920. You had to leave Boston, get in your ship, and come all the way around South America and all the way back up here to get to San Francisco. And then you could travel from San Francisco to, you know, basically Sacramento, where all the gold was, up there in the good old mother load where all, we all live. That's called Rounding the Horn, the Cape Horn. And I guess that's what's gonna happen here in this book. So it's pretty good. I hope you like it. I'll read a chapter at a time and, um, I don't know when we'll finish. We'll finish when we finish. Here we go. Chapter one of By the Great Horn Spoon by Sid Fleischman. Chapter one, The Stowaways. Stowaway is a guy who sneaks on a ship, kind of hides and gets a free trip out of it. If you were the captain of a ship, would you like stowaways? I don't think so. They didn't pay their fair share. They're getting a free ride. 
the stowaways. Here we go. A sailing ship with two great side wheels went splashing out of Boston Harbor on a voyage around the Horn to San Francisco. Below decks, in the creaking darkness of her cargo hold, there sat 18 barrels of potatoes. Inside two barrels, side by side, there squatted two stowaways. It was not once upon a time. It was precisely the 27th day of January in the year 1849. Gold had been discovered in California some 12 months before, and now, in a rush, the gold rush was on. The good ship Lady Wilma, overcrowded and heavy in the water with cargo, thrashed her way to the sea. Her paddle wheels churned, and her smokestacks stained the frozen winter sky like ink. She was bound for the gold fields with 183 passengers, not counting the stowaways. Hundreds of gold seekers had been left at the dock, clamoring for passage. The California fever was sweeping through the cities and towns and villages like a heady wind. They mean like everybody wants to go to California. They got the fever for gold. They want to get there and get some. Men were buying picks and shovels and trying to get away from the East Coast to the West as soon as possible and all at once. On the second day at sea, just after dawn, the lid rose silently off a potato barrel. Cautiously, a man raised his eyes above the rim of the barrel to look about. Slowly, he unfolded his long arms and legs, and then he stood, an elegant gentleman, in a black broadcloth coat. He would be the first to admit that being folded up in a barrel with a bowler hat balanced on his knees was not the most comfortable way to travel. Now he brushed off his hat and placed it smartly on his head. He hooked a black umbrella on his arm, for he never traveled without it, and pulled on a pair of spotless white gloves. He felt very nearly frozen solid, but permitted himself a most contented smile. And then he gave a small tap to the barrel beside him. All clear, Master Jack. Is that you, praiseworthy? Came a young, muffled voice from the depths of the barrel. Your obedient servant, the man replied, and lifted the lid. There rose from this barrel a schoolboy of twelve. He had been sucking a raw potato to slack his thirst. That means he was thirsty to get rid of his thirst. A patch of hair fell across his forehead in a yellow scribble. He had never been so cold, hungry, or miserable in his life. On the other hand, he'd never been so happy. He wouldn't have traded places with anyone. His pepper-black eyes were considerably brightened with the fever of adventure. He smelled, the pot he smelled of potatoes from head to toe. His thin nose, which was smudged, felt like an icicle, but he permitted himself a most contented smile. We made it, praiseworthy, he said. We did indeed, Master Jack. Jack gazed at the dark cargo shapes piled high around them and listened to the scrape of the sea along the wooden hull. He thought of home and Aunt Arabella and the friendly blaze in the big stone fireplace. There was no turning back now. They were on their way to the gold fields. Hungry, asked Praiseworthy. I could eat, I guess, said Jack, who didn't want to give the impression that he had any complaints. Cold? I've been colder, I guess, said Jack, although he couldn't think of when. I suggest we see what can be done about improving our accommodations, said Praiseworthy, tapping his bowler hat firmly in place. Shall we go? Go, Jack replied. Go where? He fully expected to pass the voyage below decks with the cargo. He had read dire accounts of the treatment handed out to stowaways on, a ship of sea, on ships on the sea. Why, to pay our respects to the captain, said Praiseworthy. The captain? The words were very nearly caught in his throat. But he'll put us in chains, or worse. Leave that to me, said Praiseworthy, with an airy lift of an eyebrow. Come along, Master Jack. Jack gathered courage from Praiseworthy's cool assurance. As far back as Jack could remember, he had never known anything to ruffle Praiseworthy's calm. In his black bowler hat, his black coat, and spotless white gloves, he was easily mistaken for a professional man, a lawyer perhaps, or a young doctor. But he was nothing of the sort. Praiseworthy was a butler.
It's like a guy who, you know, helps rich people, you know, get through the day, does all sorts of stuff for him. You probably know what a butler is. He was a butler by breeding, by training, and by choice. More than once, Jack had heard his Aunt Arabella say that Praiseworthy was the finest English butler in Boston. He had been with Jack's family since before Jack could remember. It seemed to him that there had always been a Praiseworthy. The ship gave a lurch, and the stowaways, gathering up their two carpet bags at their suitcases, picked their way through the darkened passage of the hold. Jack saw barrels of smoked fish bound for San Francisco. There were thousands of feet of lumber and enough bricks to build a hotel. He saw boxes of rifles and two brass cannons to fight off wild Indians, he supposed, and he could make out very wet bundles of grape cuttings, enough to plant a vineyard. With his heart thumping, Jack followed Praiseworthy up the ship's ladder to the creaking deck above. He was sure the captain would put them in chains at the very least. Now the whistling of the wind came to them, and the thrashing of the great side wheels seemed as loud as thunder. They found themselves in a cruise quarter where daylight barely penetrated. A sailor with a gold ring dancing in his ear was filling a lamp with whale oil. Oh, my good fellow, said Praiseworthy, can you direct me to the captain? The sailor looked up with a curious squint, and the ring in his ear did a jig. He's got an ear ring. The wild bull of the seas? Hey, mates. He lifted a wet thumb as a pointer. Up there. Up there they went, climbing another ladder to another deck, and now Jack was sure the captain would have them walking the plank at the very least. Wild bull of the seas. But praiseworthy was a match for anyone, he told himself and tried to keep a straight and firm jaw. They entered the main salon, where shivering passengers were swarming like bees around two pot-bellied stoves. Everyone seemed to be talking at once and saying the same thing. You've been hogging that stove long enough. I got here first. Let me in, partner. Jack saw men of every description, and some who defied description. There were lanky farm boys in rough boots and dandies in tight pantaloons. Those are pants. There were Yankees in beaver hats and Southerners in planters' hats. There were tradesmen and politicians, Frenchmen and Dutchmen, fat men and thin ones, gentlemen and scoundrels, and not a woman among them. For they were bound for the gold fields, which was no place for women and children. That seems old-fashioned, doesn't it? Give me a turn at the stoves, gent. Stop pushing, sir. Praiseworthy tapped the nearest gold seeker on the shoulder, a frock-coated man with a sword cane, and inquired, uh, Can you direct me to the captain, sir? The man lifted his sword cane and pointed. Up there, up there, he snapped, and returned to the fray. In due time, after climbing another ladder, the two stowaways found the captain in his cabin, with the door banging open and shut with the roll of the ship. He had just come in from the deck, and his wet oilskins lay in a heap. The wild bull of the seas, his legs apart, stood bent over a long table. He was trying to thaw the ice in his curly black whiskers over a lighted candle. Well, don't just stand there inviting in the weather, he said, in a voice like the roar of a cannon. Come in! The butler shut the door, only to have it fly open again. Praiseworthy at your service, sir, he said, and this young gentleman is Master Jack Flagg of Boston, who seeks his fortune in the gold fields. Bah, the ship's master, whose name was Joshua Swain, hardly bothered to look up. It was hard to tell whether he was a good man in a bad temper or a bad man in a good temper. He had a plump nose and wore a long blue coat with a row of brass buttons the size of gold pieces. The Lady Wilma, that must be the name of the ship, pitched and rolled in rough seas, and the candlestick slid from one end of the long table to the other. Captain Swain caught it just in time. Blasted weather, he growled, and me racing the sea raven round the horn, me with my hold full of bricks and twice as many passengers as I ought to carry, but I'll beat the sea raven by grabs if I have to throw the extra passengers overboard. I guess back in the day these captains... They were competitive. They wanted to see who could get from like Boston to San Francisco around the Horn as fast as they could. Because that meant, you know, you were a good captain. You knew how to sail that boat. 
So this guy's like in a competition with another boat. What's it called? The Sea Raven. And he wants to beat him. The door banged shut, and Jack, now wide-eyed, stared at the ship's master as if he were a stout devil in brass buttons and frozen whiskers. He would give them the plank for sure. Again the ship lurched. The candlestick flew, but this time Praiseworthy caught it in midair. Allow me, sir, he said, and he held the candle firmly under the captain's stiff whiskers. But the wild bull of the sea wouldn't stand still, and Praiseworthy was soon following him as he paced round the cabin. Do you know the sea raven carries in her cargo holds? Do you know what they carry? Captain Swade bellowed, miner's boots, flannel shirts, and mosquito netting. Mosquito netting! She's so light in the water, her keel is hardly damp. And then he stopped to thaw his beard over the flame, and the roar went out of his voice. Ah, he sighed, and in another moment, a smile appeared in the weathered creases of his eyes. That's better. Now then, gentlemen, what can I do for you? Jack exchanged, Jack exchanged a quick glance with Praiseworthy, who remained perfectly at ease. Oh, we wish to report a pair of stowaways, sir, said the butler. At that announcement, the captain's smile vanished, and he exploded again. Stowaways, he roared. Stowaways? By grabs, I'll skin them alive. I'll put them in chains. Where are they? In his fury, the captain almost set his whiskers aflame. Praiseworthy pinched out the candle. Standing right here, sir. Here? Where? I'll skin them alive. I'll put them in chains. Stowaways on my ship? Where are they? Uh, here, sir, repeated the butler. And Jack, swallowing hard, decided to make the best or the worst of it. Uh, standing before you, sir. It was as if for the first time Captain Swain noticed Jack at all. You, he bellowed, and his plump nose was red with anger. Why, you're a mere jib of a boy and a lad of ten. Twelve, sir, said Jack. But I can do a man's work, sir. By grabs, I'll make you walk the plank, both of you. Do you know, they've said it like three times now, this walk the plank thing. I guess they stick a piece of wood over the side of the ship. And they make you walk out to the end of it and push you over into the ocean. I guess that's walking the plank. Uh, you'd be killed for sure. I can do it. I'll make you walk the plank, both of you. If I make an, may make an observation, said Praiseworthy, you are obviously too civilized for such pirate tricks. Bah! Permit me to explain, Praiseworthy went on. It was not our intention to defraud the shipping company. The moment there was a posted notice of Lady Wilma's departure for California, Master Jack and I were in line to buy a ticket. But in the push and clamor, some clever cut purse helped himself to our passage money, leaving us penniless. I guess a cut purse is a thief. He took their money. No doubt he bought a ticket for himself and is aboard this very ship, sir. A likely story, growled the captain. An unlikely story, Praiseworth said, but true. Naturally, we had no choice but to have become stowaways. And if I may add, it is imperative, sir, that Master Jack reach the gold field and make his fortune without delay. Bah! This California fever is spreading like a plague. New England will be left half empty in another six months by grabs. Anything with a keel is calling itself a gold ship and put into sea. Scows with rotten bottoms, fish trawlers, whaling ships. Argonauts of old they are, chasing after the golden fleece. Every man at Jack thinks he will make his fortune. Bah! All this while Jack Flagg stood quietly listening, not only to the captain, but to the icy winds in the shrouds and ratlines. He stood straight and tried not to look afraid. He had made up his mind that he must reach the treasure streams of California one way or another, and this was certainly one way or another. <coughs> he refused to give in to a lurking homesickness, but he found himself thinking of his two younger sisters, Constance and Sarah, left behind in Boston with Aunt Arabella. They had surely burst into tears to find him gone, run away, and perhaps they had not dried their eyes yet. But there was no help for it, he told himself. <coughs> Neither Jack nor his sisters remembered their own parents who had been taken away by cholera. It was a terrible disease, killed a lot of people. So Jack and his sisters, they lost their parents to this cholera. Now they live with their Aunt Arabella. 
They'd gone to live with their Aunt Arabella in the big house on the bay, with almost more rooms than they could count. She was as young and beautiful as the house was old and grand. It had been in the Flagg family for more than a century. In times past, the house had been filled with servants and guests and laughter, but the family had fallen on hard times. That means they lost a lot of money. Aunt Arabella had closed off half the rooms and no longer entertained. Of her staff, she kept only an upstairs maid, a downstairs maid, and praiseworthy. And then Jack had overheard banker Stites tell Aunt Arabella that her inheritance, that means the money she got from her relatives, was almost gone. In another year, he warned her she would be virtually penniless. Even the house, with all its family memories, would have to be sold. I advise you to fire your remaining servants at once, Banker Stites had said. You can't afford them anymore. But I couldn't do that, Aunt Arabella smiled. Why, they're like members of my family. Oh, no, I, I couldn't let them go. But it was then that Jack knew he must help Aunt Arabella. But how? At the same time, stories drifted back from California, exciting everyone's imagination. He had heard of men picking up nuggets the size of goose eggs and stubbing their toes on lumps the size of pumpkins. A boy could do that, even a boy not yet 13. Without a second thought, Jack made plans to run away to the gold fields. But nothing escaped praiseworthy, and he found Jack out. Instead of informing, it means he found out what Jack was going to do. Instead of informing Aunt Arabella, for she would never consent to such a venture, Praiseworthy kept Jack's secret, and more. An excellent plan, he said, a worthy plan indeed, for he was as devoted to Aunt Arabella as Jack himself. I'll go with you, Master Jack. There will be a ship's passage to pay, and I have a few banknotes put aside, and together, pooling savings, the boy and the butler set out for the world at large. But thanks to the light-fingered thief, the world had proved to no longer uh, be no longer than the inside of a potato barrel. Blast, said the captain, standing at the porthole. There's the sea raven abeam of us now, standing there as if to thumb her nose at us. Jack got a glimpse of the other ship on the rising swell, a two-masted side-wheeler exactly like the Lady Wilma. May I, if I may observe, Praiseworthy remarked in his perfect calm, it is a 15,000 mile voyage around Cape Horn to San Francisco, I believe. It is not the beginning of a race that counts, sir, but the end. If I win the race, I'll get command of a new clipper ship built in the yards. She'll be the pride of the seas, and I want her, sir. Captain Swain unhooked the brass voice tube and bellowed to the engine room below, more steam, sir. It's all we can do to keep up more steam. And then he turned to the stowaways. You'll, walk off, you'll work off your passage on this ship by grabs. You there, boy. Jack, who was already standing straight, stood even straighter. Yes, sir. You'll work as a ship's boy. I'll run your legs off. And that's letting you off easy. And you, sir, praiseworthy at your service. What intarnation are you in that getup? I am a butler, sir. A butler? the captain roared, a butler? What in the name of Old Scratch can a butler do? I looked up Old Scratch, it means the devil. What in the name of the devil can a butler do? Oh, it's the other way around, sir, said Praiseworthy, who took pride in his calling. There's nothing a butler cannot do. I open doors, I close doors, I announce that dinner is served, I supervise the staff and captain of the household, much as you do of this ship, sir. A most exacting job, if I may say so. Bah! And Jack ventured. Aunt Arabella said he's the best there is. She said there's no problem too big for praiseworthy. Silence, boy. A butler, are you? By grabs, I know there's a door you can open. The furnace door. And you can shovel in fuel. To the coal bunkers with you, butler. Now out of my sight before I change my mind and put you both in chains. Sir? said Jack, trembling inwardly. I don't care to be a ship's boy. What? If Praiseworthy is going to the coal bunkers, I'll shovel coal too. Jack met Praiseworthy's glance, but only for a moment. We're partners, sir. Either send me to the coal bunkers or, he gulped, put me in chains. 
The wild bull of the sea was struck absolutely speechless. Don't pay any attention to Master Jack, said Praiseworthy quickly. The boy is lightheaded from sheer hunger. He hasn't eaten anything since yesterday, and he doesn't know what he's saying. Yes, I do, said Jack. You told me yourself we'd stick together through thick and thin. But this time the captain had recovered his voice, and a smile lurked in his eyes. By grabs, he said. By grabs, here's a lad with stuffings. He doesn't want an easy berth. He wants a man's job. All right, to the coal bunkers, both of you. Thank you, sir, said Jack, picking up his carpet bag. The captain cocked a shaggy eyebrow. It wouldn't hurt none if you stopped off first at the galley and told the cook I said to give you something to eat. Man can't shovel coal on an empty stomach, or a lad either. Now be out of my sight. So it looks like they're both gonna have to go down and shovel coal. Coal is what goes into a thing that boils water that runs a steam engine. And this ship is right now powered under a steam engine. So they're gonna have to shovel piles of coal into this burning thing that burns up the coal and eventually boils water. Sounds like hard work. The door flew open and the stowaways withdrew. They descended one ladder and then another and got their breakfast and reported to the engineer. He pointed out the boiler furnace, the coal bins, and the shovels. Praiseworthy removed his boiler hat, his white gloves, and the umbrella from the crook of his arm. They made a neat pile of their coats and rolled up their sleeves. Unless I miss my guess, said Praiseworthy, the wild bull of the seas is a gentleman at heart. I hope he wins the race, said Jack. The stowaways set to work shoveling coal into the yellow flames of the furnace, flames that made the steam that turned the great side wheels. Jack was eager to work beside Praiseworthy, as if it brought them even closer together. Sometimes he wished Praiseworthy would, were anything but a butler. It imposed a slight distance between them that Praiseworthy was careful to maintain. Jack would be happy to be called Jack, just Jack, and not Master Jack but Praiseworthy wouldn't hear of it, even though now they were partners. Praiseworthy, said Jack, wiping back the hair from his forehead. He had to raise his voice above the howl of the fire and the clank of the machinery. Praiseworthy, do you really believe the cut purse is aboard the Lady Wilma? Remember the cut purse, the guy who stole their money? Because they were going to buy tickets for this boat, but somebody stole it. He's the cut purse. I do indeed said the butler, digging into the bunker of coal, and we shall unmask the scoundrel. But how? How? I haven't the faintest idea, Master Jack, but between us we'll think of something by grabs. While the captain went back on deck and froze his whiskers again, while the passengers huddled round the two potbelly stoves, praiseworthy whistled, and Jack hummed. They alone of the gold seekers aboard the Lady Wilma had a roaring fire to warm them as the side wheeler went splashing through the sleet and the wind and the sea. He found a job to keep them warm. Well, that's the end of chapter one. I like it. Moving right along. I'll see you next time for chapter two. Adios, my friends.